I'll be considering together Philippians 4 verses 8 and 9. I hope you'll have those words open in front of you as we hear what God has to say to us together. War has broken out and I wonder whether we've noticed and the battleground is closer to home than we might have thought. Uh, we're not thinking of Eastern Europe. We're not thinking of a, a global conflict that's engulfing the nation of Australia. The war that we need to be concerned about is in our hearts and our minds. Did you notice that as we read in Philippians 4, and we saw last week that God's peace, in verse 7, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. But why would our hearts or minds need to be guarded unless they were in danger? Maybe you've noticed the enemy's attack. Uh, that thought that crosses your mind uh, what God is really concerned about are my actions and just my actions. That, that what I think about and what I want is not so important to God. He maybe doesn't even notice what's going on inside. But the behaviour on the outside, that's what he's really concerned with. But we can see just in a couple of verses from Philippians, we've read that God cares about how we think and the attitudes in our hearts. He said in verse 4, didn't he, that we are to rejoice in him always. That's an attitude before it's ever an action. He commanded us in verse 6 not to worry or be anxious. That's an attitude of our hearts, isn't it? It's about the way that we think. And so our attitudes and thoughts can be disobedient to God. Or another attack, and it's a, a very popular thought today, is the idea that what we think about is incredibly important. Actually, that our thoughts determine what will happen in our lives, that if we visualise something or speak about it, that it will happen. And that is another attack from the devil. It is another lie. Uh, his native language is lies, remember. Uh, our thoughts don't have creative power. Uh, they don't bring into being things that don't exist. What we think about does not attract sickness or success or prosperity or power to us. But as we see here in God's word, our thoughts do matter. And not because they change our world, but because they shape our lives. They change our actions. That's why God does not just say, here are a list of rules for us. Even the great list of commandments that we think of in Exodus chapter 20, the Ten Commandments, does not start with the outside actions. Remember that. As we, we think of them, we can easily remember, oh, don't murder, don't steal, don't commit adultery. But before all of them, God addresses the heart. Notice in Exodus 20, verses 2 and 3, he starts by saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other God before me. He reminds his people who he is and what he has done to save them. And from the start, the Ten Commandments are meant to be an obedient expression of grateful and loving hearts. Whether you have a God besides the Lord doesn't show up first of all in our actions. It happens in our minds and in our hearts first of all. And so here in Philippians 4, God reminds us again who he is. 
In verse 9, he calls himself the God of peace. And he lights up in these two short verses the battleground in our hearts and in our minds. Uh, This is where the spiritual warfare happens. It's not about territory. It's not about places being under the control of the evil one. It is about minds and whether they believe and accept the truth. That is the spiritual battleground. And so we need to realise that what we think will either transform our lives or it will deform them. That's the principle in Romans 12, isn't it? Do not be conformed, don't be pressed into the shape of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. And it is the same principle here too, isn't it, in Philippians 4. What we think determines how we will live. And what we think about will either transform our lives or it will deform them. It will make them into the wrong shape. So what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Well, recognise the danger. Think right. Well, first, that's where we'll start, isn't it, in verse 1. Uh, with thinking, uh, thinking the right way. Uh, We've heard Paul's reminders again and again in this letter. In chapter 1, he told us to live worthy of the gospel. Or uh, back in chapter 3, verse 16, to live up to what we've already attained. And that shows us what we believe will shape how we live. And so we're told here, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, Whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. It will be impossible for us to focus on wrong things and then live in a right way. And so we need to train our minds to think about what is good. Or what Paul is describing here in verse 8, when he says, think about such things. This is an ongoing, continual action. Uh, he's not saying just think about what is good once or twice. Uh, think about what is good when you feel like it. Uh, think about excellent and praiseworthy things when you have the time. No, make it your pattern. Now, don't let your mind dwell on anything else. So what should we think about? What should be the menu of things that our mind should be set on? Well, there are eight adjectives describing what we should think about here in verse 8. Whatever is true, he says. God is the God of truth. Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. And so we should be careful to think about what is true. The danger of being deceived is a constant danger. There are always people, even in the church, who seek to twist the truth. I've heard that saying that the strongest lie is, what is it, 90% true. And then just that little bit that's not quite right. And we have to guard our minds against being consumed by lies or destructive fantasies. Paul says, whatever is noble, are these are the things that are good. God himself is good. And so we should think about what is moral and what is good. Our, our minds shouldn't be in the gut. Think about whatever is right. And God determines what's right, doesn't he? Jesus warns us in the Sermon on the Mount that uh, to hate someone, uh, to think about things that are not right, to actually desire to do what is wrong. 
is the same as murdering them in our hearts. Uh, lust is the same as the desire uh, to commit adultery, even when we don't have the opportunity. So are our minds filled with right things? Whatever is pure, that builds on that, doesn't it? Uh, if we could know every one of God's actions, we would, and the motivation behind them, we would never be appalled. And there should be nothing corrupt or impure in our thinking either. He says, whatever is lovely, well, God is lovely, isn't he? But not just in that sentimental way that we, we use the word lovely. He is attractive. He's wholesome. Our mind should not meditate on what is horrible. And we'll need to remember that in the weeks and, dare I say, months ahead. Uh, it includes what we watch on the news, doesn't it? Uh, we need to be informed about what's happening in the world, but we need to beware having our minds caught up with that. Uh, just being consumed by the grief, horror of what's going on in our world. And we can know enough to know what's going on and to be prayerful about it without being bogged down and worn out. Maybe this is a good time to retune your radio or change your alarm so you don't wake up to the news. Maybe this is a good time to, to choose a Christian book to read or, or to listen to rather than spending the night watching 24-hour news channels. We need to lift our eyes above what's going on in this world to see the King who reigns over it all. Not to live in la-la land, disconnected from what's happening, but to never drop our eyes from what is lovely. Paul says we should think about whatever is admirable. Well, God is worthy to be honoured, isn't he? Uh, it's easy to, to think of people or situations that aren't worth admiring. But we need to fill our minds with examples that are worthy of honour. And then Paul sums up all of those things in the last two words that he uses here in verse 8. Uh, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, Think about such things. So what do our minds tend to go back to? And what do we, what do we tend to think about? Uh, is it the, the excellent things that are morally good? Uh, are our minds approving of things that God is not, or that God condemns? It's really the, the test here, isn't it? Would God praise what I'm thinking of? What I'm filling my mind with? And it can be hard to examine our hearts and to know what our minds really are filled with. But as Jesus says, we, uh, what we think about will show. We read that, didn't we, in Matthew chapter 15? That out of the heart come... The words of our mouths, and out of the heart come our evil thoughts. They are what defile a person, Jesus says. So when you speak, do true things come out. Was it gossip and smears and insults? Oh, I'm only joking. Are you willing to talk about things now that? you would have been ashamed to speak of once. What do your words and actions show is going on in your heart? We can often think that our thoughts and our attitudes are private, but they do show, they do come out. And they matter to one another. Uh, in the church, as brothers and sisters in Christ, 
we need to watch out for each other's hearts. In Hebrews chapter 3, we're told, See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. See, we're responsible to help each other, to guard our hearts. And we can help each other as we encourage one another. It's always a grief, isn't it, when, when someone who has been amongst us seems to be a believer, wanders off or storms off. Say, well, how did that happen? Were they not guarding their heart? Were they given in to sin and unbelief? But were we encouraging them? Were we taking every day called today to help each other in the battle for our minds and our hearts? <laughs> Sounds like hard work, doesn't it? It sounds difficult. It sounds uncomfortably personal. You might be thinking, well, is it, even, if it, is it ever going to be worth going here? What difference is it going to make? Well, if we think right, we'll do right, or we can anyway. In verse 9, we're told that what we think about will transform our lives or it will deform them. Why? Because what we think determines what we'll do. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. Here is a second command to continually put into practice what we're trained to do as followers of Jesus. And there is a huge assumption there, isn't there? The assumption is that we have been trained and shown how to follow Jesus. Well, that we are being shown how to follow him. And Jesus expects this of his church, doesn't he? In Matthew 28, he says that we are to teach them all that he has commanded the message of the gospel should shape how we live. So how are we meant to be taught? How are we meant to be trained to live in line with the gospel? We're told here in Philippians 4, through what we have learned or received or heard or seen. Are those first two, what we learn? What we receive, those are the things someone has deliberately set out to teach us, like is happening right now. Uh, the, the lessons that we have learned as someone has instructed us in what the Bible teaches and what we are to believe. It happens in preaching, in Bible teaching, in, in Bible study. It happens informally too when we meet with other Christians around God's Word. And so is, is that what we come for? Do we come to be taught God's word? Do we, do we expect that our lives will be different because of what we hear? Because of what we receive and what we learn? Or have we made church a spectator sport? There's something else here too, isn't there? Paul talks about what we have heard from him or seen in him. We must be at a disadvantage then. Um, I, I don't ask people their ages, but none of us are old enough to have seen or met or heard directly from Paul, have we? So how can we know what Paul did or what Paul said? Well, he said uh, to Timothy that what he had seen, he was to entrust to faithful people who would teach others. And so we have the examples of Christians down through the years. Uh, the idea of following other Christians is in the New Testament. It was 
uh, just the previous chapter in Philippians 3, verse 17, that we're to join together in following his example and to keep an eye on those who live as Paul and his companions did. And so there should be people in our experience, in our life today, who are examples to us. Uh, see, it's, it's essential not just to be told the truth and taught the truth, we need to see it in action. We know, don't we, we so much is caught rather than taught. And we follow others, whether we like to admit it or not. Uh, any group of people, uh, and the church is no exception, any group of people has a culture, a flavour, the way that we do things here, the way that we behave towards one another and what is okay and what is not. And that includes the way that we follow Jesus. So when we look at Christians around us, but do we get the message that repenting from sin is essential? Or do we see people trusting Jesus not only to save them but to be their Lord? And would anyone observing our life as God's people think that it's important to pray if we're Christians? Or would people see our lives? And know that following Jesus means obeying him when it costs. It's uncomfortable to ask that about the people around us, but, but what about ourselves? Are we role models for other Christians? If another Christian followed Jesus the way I did, would that be a good thing for them? If other believers here made their decisions the way I do, would that help them grow and mature as Christians? These are questions we can ask. What are people hearing from me and seeing in me and my life? Will that help them to be transformed and grow to be like Jesus? Or will it distort his image in me? These are really hard questions but incredibly important questions it matters because what we think about not only changes our lives but it sets an example for the people around us it will either make us and them more like jesus or less like him others are learning from our examples whether we realize it or not so don't just hear the word as James says. And so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Now don't come to the end of your life saying, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name and drive out demons in your name and in your name perform many miracles? Do all these wonderful things for Jesus. And yet hear him say, I never knew. Away from me, you evil doers. No, build your life on his word. Listen to what he says. Put it into practice and get help to do that. We should be able to help one another. It'll be hard, won't it? Hey, you know that some of the stuff God commands you will be stuff we don't want to do. I... I Unlike that. It will be uncomfortable to live like Jesus. It'll be unpopular. You know that. It'll cost. It'll cost opportunities and friendships. It may cost us family even. And there will be conflict for the sake of the gospel. Conflict we'd rather not fight. Remember where we began. That this is a spiritual battle. And the battlefield is our mind and our hearts what we think, what we want if we decide not to fight we don't get out of the battle just means we'll lose so remember where Paul finishes here in verse 9 
as we put into, the, into practice the things that we're taught, the things we've caught from others about how to follow Jesus, however hard they are, God gives us his promise. In fact, he promises us himself. The God of peace will be with you. Back in verse 7, he promised the peace of God. He promised his peace. And now he promises himself, who is peace. And so when fighting to believe the truth, we would rather not accept. And when we're battling to keep our minds pure, when we are going to war against ideas that are not excellent or praiseworthy, God is with us. As we resist the pressure to be conformed to the worldly example around us, when we're being transformed as our minds are renewed and it costs us the way we'd love to live, God will be with us there. And he is worth it. And not only does God use his gospel to make our lives excellent and, and worthy of imitation, but he also reveals himself to us. That's why Paul says that the God of peace will be with us. Because we get so much more than a moral life where we can tick off the Ten Commandments. We will know God is here with us. His character will be our example. His presence will be our comfort. And his grace will be our help. So it matters, brothers. It matters, sisters, who is winning the war in your heart. And in your mind. Because what we think about, and what our minds are fixed on, what our hearts love, will either transform us to be like Jesus Christ, or it will crush and deform our lives to show we don't know or have the God of peace with us. So who is winning the war in your heart and in your mind Today. Let's pray. Our God, you are mighty and holy and merciful and gracious. You say that you know our heart. And nothing can be hidden from you. Nothing that we have ever wanted or thought about doing, you realise would get caught and changed our minds. Nothing that we have longed for but would never express. None of that is a surprise to you. The darkest corners of our hearts that we would not show to anyone are lit up in the holy and searching light of your spirit. And yet you have chosen to love us. We are flawed by your grace. So help us to encourage one another to resist the sin that so easily entangles, the deception that tell us we can live as we like. Help us to defend one another from sinful and unbelieving hearts and to encourage one another whenever it's called today. Because we need your help. Thank you for your promise to be with us, however great the cost, however hard the fight. Strengthen us. So that when we have done all that we can, we would stand. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.